Kia ora whanau, nā mihi. A big hello and welcome to Fishers for the Future, a UNESCO Ocean Decade event coming to you from Aotearoa, New Zealand in the Southwest Pacific. We are going to start off this evening with a karakia, a traditional greeting, and Brendan Flack is going to do that for us. So Brendan, over to you. Ka kore ki te manu, ka wairore te kutu, ko te ātanui, ka haraina, ka take te umere, he pō, he pō, he ao, he ao kawatea, o te hei mauri ora. Ki ora kāpai, thank you, Brendan. While we allow time for everyone to join, we would like to invite you, our audience, to introduce yourselves to us in the chat. We would love to know where you're tuning in from. It's a late summer evening here at the bottom of the world. What time is it where you are? You are welcome to put your answers in the chat box, which is accessed by the text bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. If you look down there, click that, it should bring up the chat panel on the right hand side. While you're looking for that, this session will run for no more than 90 minutes and it is being recorded so you can watch it, watch it again or share it with others. Okay, let me introduce myself. Ko Alison Balance, aho. I am your MC for the evening. I'm a natural history writer, a broadcaster, a diver who loves swimming with crowds of fish in a marine reserve, a rock pool explorer. With me, virtually, not literally, are three amazing speakers, and I'll introduce them very soon. But first, let's start with a bit of background about what brings us together today. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development started last year. Its vision is the science we need for the ocean we want. We are part of a worldwide Ocean Decade Laboratory event, three days of virtual activities taking place around the world in place of the original in-person event that had been planned. Thanks, COVID. We are delighted though, to be part of a virtual laboratory exploring the theme of a healthy and resilient ocean. This particular satellite lab is brought to you by Sea Week, Kaupapa Moana. Sea Week is New Zealand's annual national week celebrating the sea. And we are in the middle of it right now, celebrating our 20th birthday. Sea Week's mission is about exciting and inspiring all New Zealanders to renew their connections with the sea. Tonight's fabulous guest speakers are gonna share some of their knowledge and highlight various marine management tools that work across the country. They span pretty much the length of the country from north of Auckland, our largest city located in the North Island, as far south as Dunedin, almost all the way to the bottom of the South Island. We're going to be hearing about different types of marine protected areas and the role these play in marine conservation. Conservation to ensure that our treasured marine species endure for future generations. We'll hear from Dr. Nick Shears at the University of Auckland's Lee Marine Laboratory. Nick's research and interests encompass understanding the ecological effects of fishing on kelp forest ecosystems, how to restore kelp forest, and the impact of sediment from the land and the effects of climate change on rocky reef ecosystems. His talk will be followed by a joint presentation by Dr. Chris Hepburn and Brendan Flack. They are both with the Coastal People Southern Skies Centre of Research Excellence. They will explain some of the research they're involved in, built upon the foundation of building positive connections between kaitiaki or local guardians and scientists for the benefit of them both. They will share a bit about their role in facilitating research, which supports communities in their journeys towards fishery restoration. Sorry about that. Um, I think I should start with a bit of background context for our international audience. So this is a potted summary of something that will help you make sense of what we're going to talk about. So Aotearoa New Zealand was the last land mass on the planet to be settled by humans. The first Polynesian explorers, the ancestors of our Māori population today, arrived here on voyaging waka, ocean-going canoes, 
about 750 years ago. European settlers followed about 200 years ago. And together, we have wrought great changes to this country and its ecosystems. We are a long, skinny country with lots of rich, productive coastline, about 1,500 kilometers of coastline, in fact. In terms of ocean area, we have the world's fourth largest e exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, more than 4 million square kilometers of sea, stretching from the subtropics to the subantarctic. We catch a lot of fish in that EEZ. The commercial fishery is managed under a quota management system, and there are also bag limits or catch limits in place for the many enthusiastic recreational fishers. New Zealand created its first no-take, fully protected marine reserve in 1975. It was the first in the Southern Hemisphere. We now have 44 marine reserves, two marine parks, three marine protected areas, and six marine mammal sanctuaries, all of which have slightly different roles. Māori approaches to marine conservation are different to this preservationist no-take approach. In recognition of this, and of Māori customary fishing rights, iwi or tribes from around the country have worked to create reserves known as mataitai and taiapuri in places where fishing has traditional significance. Taiapuri, and you will hear more about these, are fishing areas intended to be managed by local tribes. Mataitai are areas where local tribes manage all aspects of non-commercial fishing by making laws which apply to everyone. Generally, there is no commercial fishing in a Matai Tai. Uh, there are some other Māori words which you will hear tonight. We will try and explain those as we go. A key one is kaimoana that you might hear a lot. This is a te reo or Māori word that literally means food, kai, of the sea, the moana. It doesn't just mean seafood, which is for consumption, but kaimoana includes many edible marine species found in New Zealand's marine environment. Our speakers will be telling us much more about all of this, but just before we head to them, and we're nearly there with them, you can send us your questions at any time using the question and answer function, the Q&A function, which should also be on the bottom of your screen. Once the speakers have done their bit, we will try and answer as many of your questions as we can. So, it's almost time for our first speaker for tonight, Dr. Nick Shears. Nick is a specialist in rocky reef ecology and marine conservation. He's an associate professor in the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Auckland's Lee Marine Laboratory. Over to you, Nick. Unmute, good start. Um, thanks, Alison. Uh, kia ora toto. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, this evening or this morning, whichever it might be, wherever you are. Um, so I'm going to be talking about an, an overview, really, of marine protection in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'll talk a little bit about the different types of marine protected areas um, we have, and then a little bit about um, well, a, a summary of the sort of years of research and what we've learned um, about, well, from marine protected areas um, in Aotearoa. In particular, how they, um, what they tell us about the impacts of fishing and how they can be used to reverse the impacts of fishing. So, Alison referred to us being down at the bottom of the planet, and we, we sure are, and we, we really are a, a maritime um, nation surrounded in ocean and quite isolated. We have a range, a big EEZ, as Alison introduced, um, and we have a range of different types of marine protected areas. Starting at a large scale um, in our EEZ, we have a number of seamount closures in the green. Um, and then in the yellow, these are benthic protect protection areas, which um, are in initiated by the commercial fishing industry and provide some level of protection for the, the sea floor in those areas. As we come into the, cl the coast, we have a, a number of marine mammal sanctuaries that limit certain types of fishing to try and prevent um, mammal, marine mammals getting caught. Um, and I apologize, this map is not completely up to date. 
But then as we move right into the, clo the coast, um, we have marine reserves, which we'll hear more about. These, these are completely no-take areas, but as you can see, they only cover a very small proportion of our coast, less, less than 1% of our coast around mainland New Zealand. Now we have other types of marine protected areas as well, um, with different sorts of restrictions, um, but generally such as cable protection zones. And as Alison referred to, we have a large number of customary protection areas, so Mataitai, Taiapuri, and Rahui. So um, Chris and Brennan will be talking more about these, but you can see we have a lot of them around the country. And these are types of protection measures that local iwi or um, communities have put together um, to lay down some sort of restrictions around their um, coastal area to protect either certain species or certain environments. And we've really seen in the last few years an upsurge in the use of some of these customary tools um, in response to declines um, that are happening and traditional sort of man well not traditional um, government led management hasn't really um, stepped in so here we are able to um, implement measures to protect um, areas of our coast. So what have we learned from marine protection? I'm, I'm going to focus in on the Hauraki Gulf, um, Tikapa Moana, which is the main body of water adjacent to Auckland, our biggest, our biggest city here, which has nearly, or well, pushing 2 million people. Um, it's our busiest and most highly used body of water in New Zealand. Um, there's a large number of impacts, like any um, ocean close to a large city. We have runoff of sediments and nutrients from um, farming and forestry. But the biggest impact in this area is, is fishing. And it's to demonstrate that, I've just showing you some maps here um, of the types of fishing, the distribution of different types of fishing in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, on the left here, this is the trawling, where trawling occurs, mainly in the outer gulf, which is commercial trawling. In the middle is long lining, which is generally spread um, more widely throughout the Hauraki Gulf. And then on the right is recreational fishing. So you can see it's much more um, inshore, shallower areas. But if you sort of put a merge them all together in one, you, you can really fill in that entire area. Uh, you'll notice that this area outlined is also called a marine park. It's the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park. That doesn't actually mean that it has any, it's a management body, it doesn't have any specific um, regulations associated with it. Um, but what you can see is there's some areas, such as this large cable protection zone, which um, where fishing is prohibited. And if you look really closely, you can see some pink, little pink spots, which are our no-take marine reserves. And as across the whole country, they only um, cover less than 1% of our um, coastal area. But those little tiny marine reserves have provided a disproportionate amount of information on um, both the impacts of fishing and uh, marine for marine con conservation. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So the one I was just pointing to actually is New Zealand's oldest marine reserve. It's about an hour's drive north of Auckland. Um, and it's the Cape Rodney to Okakari Point or, or Lee Marine Reserve. It's roughly about five kilometres long, uh, includes Goat Island in the centre here and extends about 800 metres offshore. So this is a completely no-take marine reserve, no fishing allowed of any type. Um, prior to it becoming a marine reserve, it was a very, very popular spot um, for fishing. Now, the reason that was established is it's sits on the door, our University of Auckland Research Laboratory is just located on the shores of the marine reserve here. Um, here's the laboratory and the reserve was established um, under the Marine Reserves Act um, for the purposes of preserving the area for scientific research. It wasn't, I don't think there was such a thing hardly as marine conservation in, in 1971. It wasn't set up for any, with any expectations of what might happen or to understand the impacts of fishing. Um, but following how things have changed through time within the marine reserve relative to outside, as well as changes in other reserves, um, 
have provided a lot of information on, on both our effects of, of fishing on the environment and how we restore, how, how the reserves can reverse those impacts. So this is just showing you sort of how we do our research and monitoring. We have a series of sites within a marine reserve and a series of sites outside that we can compare. So the marine reserve basically provides an experiment to look at the impacts of fishing, because that's what's excluded. So these, these are four um, well-known reserves in northeastern New Zealand, and they've all showed similar sorts of res responses to um, fish fishing. Firstly, we'll start with our, our snapper, Chrysophorus auratus, which is a hugely popular um, species to eat. Um, it's heavily a prized fish for recreational fishermen. It's the most heavily targeted um, saltwater species in the country. And there's a very large um, commercial take of this species as well. It's a generalist predator. Historically, it would have been a very important predator on our rocky reefs. Um, but it's, as with most, our, all of our fisheries, it's managed under the quota management system. Despite being managed under this quota management system, the fishery is estimated to be just below about 20% of what it would have been prior to fishing. But what we see within a marine reserve, once they've been protected, is, is an, almost an order of magnitude higher biomass and abundance of snapper in these reserves compared to um, the fish surrounding areas. Um, Generally, the surrounding areas are between sort of five and 20%, so probably lower than what the fisheries estimates are. Um, but as well as having more abundant snapper in these reserves, they're considerably larger. Um, in fished areas, we have a legal size limit that prevents fish below 30 centimetres being um, kept. Um, and so the numbers of fish above 30 centimetres in the fished areas are very low. Whereas inside the reserve areas, we see much higher numbers of large fish. And this is important because a large fish, such as a snapper that's 70 centimeters long, produces the same number of eggs as 30, sorry, 36 legal size snapper. So protecting these large snapper um, has a disproportionate effect on the egg production. So we estimate that a reserve such as Lee produces about 18 times more eggs um, than snapper than an equivalent area of coast in the surrounding environment. So a five kilometer long reserve produces the same number of eggs, snapper eggs, as 90 kilometers of fished coast. So what, what happens to those eggs and larvae that are released from the marine reserve? Do they contribute to the surrounding fishery? So there's been modeling work done on this to, to look at how eggs that are spawned within the marine reserve um, travel around the surrounding coast. And you can see um, a lot of them stick within the immediate area, um, follow the coast, and depending on weather conditions, they'll disperse further offshore. But this modeling work showed a lot of the, the eggs were staying in the surrounding area and likely seeding um, surrounding fisheries. This is now being supported by genetic analysis. Um, this genetic parentage analysis was um, published about five years ago, um, where they were able to match the genetics of juvenile snapper caught in the surrounding area to parents within the marine reserve. So they collected a library of um, a sort of a genetic library of the snapper within the reserve and were able to match juveniles back to um, having parents within the reserve. And that, based on that study, about they estimate about 11% of snapper in the surrounding area come from parents within the marine reserve. So it shows that even a tiny little reserve can have a disproportionate contribution to the um, surrounding fishery. Um, another highly important species, um, both from an ecological um, and social and economic perspective and cultural, is um, koda or crayfish, Jason said wardsii. Um, here's a large one out wandering around within a marine reserve. This species sort of follows a similar trajectory um, to, to snapper and from a fisheries perspective with very large catches um, in the middle of last century. 
declines and then relatively low levels in recent times. But what we see similarly in the marine reserve is much higher um, abundances and much larger individuals in, in these reserves. Um, on the right here just shows you some size structure data. The red is showing you what the size structure of the fish population looks like and the gray is showing you what the size structure of the um, reserve population look like. So with much larger um, lobster in these reserves, they're producing between 50 to 23 times more eggs and larvae than the surrounding coast. And then we can also use the, um, the um, this estimate of a fished population, sorry, the reserve is an estimate of an unfished population to assess the status of the surrounding fishery. So the stock assessments estimate the fishery to be at about 20%, but when we use the reserve as an unfished reference point, we estimate that these populations in the fished areas is, up, is less than 5%. So there's a real mismatch there with what we're seeing in the commercial fishery, but it, it provides an additional source of information from these MPAs that can be used to evaluate um, fishery status. Now, just moving on from the sort of species that we like to catch and eat, um, what we've also seen is the ecosystem change within these reserves. So both snapper and crayfish are important predators of sea urchins or kinna um, in New Zealand. And this aerial image shows you Goat Island in, in 1975 before it became fully protected. Nice clear day and you can see all of the subtitle reef, but what you'll notice is this reef, is this light coloration is actually sea urchin barrens or kinna barrens. So these are areas of reef where high numbers of sea urchins have eaten all of the kelp. When the reserve was established, this was considered to be just a normal thing. What, you know, that's what the reefs were like. But what we've seen in this reserve at Lee and other reserves is over time with the recovery of these important predators, the number of sea urchins or kinna declined and the kelp has come back. So within these reserves, um, we've seen a big increase in kelp which is obviously important um, primary producer, provides habitat for lots of species. And so it's a real shift or recovery of the whole ecosystem. Um, this is evident in these maps here of the reserve. So the pink being Kinnabarrens when the reserve was established. And now well, in 2019, very little area of Kinnabarrens except once you go outside of the reserve, the pink around and towards the edges. So this is an example where within a marine reserve, the recovery of predators has led to this sort of recovery of the entire kelp ecosystem. If we look at other types of marine protected areas, so there's a marine park in the northern parts of New Zealand that allows recreational um, fishing, but prohibits commercial fishing. We've actually seen that kinnabarrens have increased in this marine park over similar time scales. So the pink areas you can see have increased and different, obviously different mapping techs and techniques now used now, but within this marine protected area, by allowing fishing has meant that um, the snapper and the crayfish haven't recovered over time. So they haven't played that role in terms of re um, um, reducing the kinna. So, and the same sorts of patterns are seen in fished areas where there's also historic maps of the reefs. This is the Mokahinau Islands, in the 70s and then in 2019, and there's been a similar sort of increase. So clearly around the northeastern coast of New Zealand, we've seen a generally an increase in the amount of kinnabarrens over time, except within our um, marine reserves where the opposite pattern has occurred. Just to highlight this is this is Hauturu Otoi, which is a little barrier island in the center of the Hauraki Gulf. This is a, a conservation um, poster child really, it's, it's an incredible, uh, it was New Zealand's first nature reserve on the land, huge amount of effort goes into keeping predators off this island, um, translocating species onto it. But when you go into the surrounding waters, it's fully, it's wide open for fishing. You're allowed to um, take you know, any species you like, there's limits. But what's happened, unlike on the land at Hauturu, is the surrounding reefs have been um, large areas have been deforested by kinnabarrens over this, you know, the last 40, 50 years. So this, this really highlights the mismatch in New Zealand between how we treat our land areas and conservation on the land 
um, versus underwater. So just to sort of wrap up, um, hopefully you can see that the, these no-take no marine protected areas or um, have been highly effective in allowing recovery of key species as well as the important ecosystems um, in the marine environment. There's a lot of value from a scientific perspective in terms of protecting places like this to provide reference, reference points to understand the impact of fisheries on both species and ecosystems and how they can be used as a reference point to, to look at the state of stocks. Um, there are obvious conservation um, values and there's also some further fisheries values. Um, but these values do depend on the goals of an MPA and the design, um, depends on what, what fishing methods are excluded and for how long. And also they need to be effectively designed in terms of be large enough to protect these species if you want um, the ecosystems to recover, the species and ecosystems to recover. So in New Zealand, we have a, a number of different um, mechanisms for est establishing MPAs that I sort of referred to at the start. But unfortunately, at this st stage, we still don't really have a, we don't have a holistic approach um, that to ocean governance that integrates both, integrates both fisheries and conservation management. So, you know, that's an area that we need to work on and um, develop, but there, there ha is some promise and, and hope and so just to finish, um, the Hauraki Gulf has a proposal in place for a number of um, protected areas. Um, these aren't marine reserves. They're not gonna be established under the Marine Reserves Act. They're referred to as high protection areas. Um, they're, they are largely no take, but they may allow some customary activities. Um, there's also a number of seafloor, seafloor protection areas proposed. Um, which would be, you know, ultimately this, if this goes ahead, it would lead to a big increase in the proportion of area um, protected within the Gulf. It's likely to be implemented through new legislation um, and the process is currently undergoing consultation with EWI, I understand. So this is an important first step um, towards improving protection in the Hauraki Gulf, um, reversing some of the long-term trends. Um, and there is a wider goal of protecting 30% of the, um, the Hauraki Gulf as well. So I just want to finish by acknowledging um, Bill Ballantyne, Roger Grace and Wade Doak, who um, sadly are not with us anymore, but they, they really were the, um, the pioneers of marine conservation and marine protection in New Zealand. So thanks everyone for, for listening. Kia ora, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Next, we have Brendan Flack and Chris Hepburn presenting together. Dr. Chris Hepburn is co-director of the Coastal People Southern Skies Centre of Research Excellence based at the University of Otago in Dunedin. The centre connects local communities with world-leading cross-disciplinary research to rebuild coastal ecosystems in a changing ocean. Chris studies coastal ecosystems in southern New Zealand, focusing on the impacts of human-induced change. And Brendan Flack. Brendan is Kaitahu, that's his tribal affiliation. He is Tangata Tiaki, or guardian, for Kati Huirapa, and is chair of the East Otago Taiapuri Committee. We've mentioned Taiapuri before, a fishing area managed by local Māori. Brendan has led the Taiapuri and the broad challenge of strengthening rights, mātauranga, or knowledge, and the culture around mahinga kai. Mahinga or mahika kai is literally the resources of an area, the animals that you eat, the plants, maybe even the rocks that you use. Brendan will explain this much better than I am. He works as a researcher on the Coastal People Southern Skies Programme on local climate change impacts and response, as well as fisheries and habitat restoration. Chris and Brendan, over to you. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Tarapu te Moka, ko Mata'o te Awa, no Aitipo te Aho, ko Chris Hepburn toko ingoa. Hello everybody, um, my name's Chris. Um, I come from a place called Cromwell, which is as far from the, from the sea as you can be in New Zealand. And 
on the on the banks of our largest river, the Mata'o or Clutha River. Um, I'd um, yeah, just like to um, say thanks very much, Nick, for, for your talk. And um, we're going to talk a, a, a little more freely about some other things. I think it's really important to um, acknowledge Nick's work and, and the work of um, scientists before him that um, provide the information that allow us to make really good decisions um, in management of, of the marine environment. So um, good work out there. So um, I'd just like to talk um, a little bit about Brendan, um, Alison talked a little about him. He's been a leader um, on a coast there. He um, comes from a um, sub-tribe or hapu called Kaitirua Hikihiki. And he um, has been a key um, part of um, the re revitalization of um, Mahinga Kai, as Alison mentioned before, and also of, a, of the culture of Kaitahu or Naitahu in the far south. So it's a great, a great I guess privileged to have Brendan sitting beside me and quite often we're off doing fun things. So we've put this talk together earlier today, so hopefully it's um, of interest and sort of flows together. But um, hello everyone out there and um, hopefully this is enjoyable for you. So Brendan, um, I've got a talk outline. Um, I think I've got the wrong talk up, so I'm gonna change that. That's not a good look, um, sorry. The, the slide started the same. Um, as I said, we put it together today. Um, that's your one, Brendan. That's it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris, uh, for that uh, nice introduction. Um, and then the hospital pass of not having a... Uh, we're, 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 we're coming there. We're, we're getting there. So uh, firstly, yeah, um, yeah I'm Kaitaru Hikihiki from the, the far south of um, uh, Te Waiponamu. Uh, I really wanted to start off talking a little bit about water, in fact, because and the, connect, the cultural connection that we have. I mean, water is the place where those fish live. So uh, the, the interface between the fresh water and the, um, the salt water. Uh, this map here was uh, one of Beatty's maps who came through here in the early days and talked to Kaumatua, that's elders of the areas. And uh, he mapped some of the important uh, mahinga kai areas, so those food working places. Um, next slide there, Chris, thanks. Man. So um, in Te Reo Māori, uh, you may say to somebody, uh, ko wai koe, you know, who, who are you? And what you're actually saying is, what are your waters? So, it, um, and then where are you from? No wai koe, so what waters are you from? So people and water are inter, interconnected in, in the Māori worldview in terms of the makeup of the person and those waters, whether they're the embryonic waters or the ancestral waters of the rivers that flow into those coastal areas. Um, just a little bit of the whakapapa of um, Te Waka Aoraki. So Te Waka Aoraki is one of those really early names for Te Waiponamu. Uh, there's Tuaka uh, Maui as well, so Maui's canoe and the fish, of course, where, where Nick is living uh, in the, the North Island, but Tuaka Aoraki and uh, the, the kōrero, the, the understandings we have is maku, which is the moisture, coupled with a cloud that grew from the dawn, you know, that uh, northeast bank that we, we see here in, in um, southern New Zealand. And from that union came Raki or Ranginui, so the sky father who coupled with Pokoharu Ruatipo. And now their children, their children included Auraki and his brothers. And the, the brothers decided to come down and visit their stepmother. Long story, but um, they, come, they decided to come down and visit um, Papatuanuku. And when they uh, went to leave again on their canoe, on their, on their waka, um, they didn't get the karakia dead right. They didn't, they didn't um, repeat that incantation uh, appropriately. And so they were stuck here and they formed, Auraki and his, and his brothers formed the Southern Alps. Uh, thanks, next one there, Chris. Uh, 
focus. So uh, koaio, uh, who am I? Or what, what is you know what is my river? So ko auraki te maukas, ko wa, uh, waitaki te awa, ko araitiuru te tai. So auraki, the connection to auraki as an ancestor and in the landscape here, um, it gives gives southern Māori that connection that to those big mountains, to those big rivers that form that cultural landscape, which in turn um, arrive on our coastline now. Araitiuru is the, the name of our, our, our coastal area. Araitiuru was one of the, one, uh, one, a waka. And um, Alison, you mentioned those voyaging canoes. And so the, the, the story that we have with the Araitiuru was built in New Zealand and then returned with the, the Kumara and was um, wrecked uh, just north of where we're speaking from today at a place called Matakaya. So just some, uh, continuing with this um, fresh water, this, this water theme, um, the spring of life, the puna, the spring. So we have our tūpuna, you know, our ancestors. We have our mokopuna, our, our grandchildren. And the connection, once again, with the puna, the water, and, and the spring, spring of life, if you like. Um, uh, there's some other words there, he pataka waiora, it's a, it's a program that we have around a 200 year restoration. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And it is developed, uh, this a pataka is a, uh, a, food, a food store. So looking at the landscape as a food store rather than um, as a, uh, I guess, a, a physical um, food store. And then we have wairua, uh, the two waters, so Wairu is a, a name for uh, many things, spirit um, and so forth. But in this, in this example, it's the two water, or two of the waters, Waitai, uh, the salt water, and Waimari, uh, the, the fresh water. And then as Nick had mentioned a little bit earlier, Taipuri and Mataite, which we'll talk about. But these, these young people there, they're our waka kids, some of our waka uh, after school waka local kids and we we found some tuna some eels in a really degraded um supposedly freshwater body and uh we collected these eels and put them into some place that was a little more uh less degraded no quite almost pristine so these these young ones actually learned a little bit about the life cycle of those eels because those eels, you know, they live in the fresh water, you know, they're born in the salt water, move to the fresh water and then back to the to the salt water. So um, understanding that connection, that deep connection between Waitai and Wai Māori is really important uh, for you know for for our young ones anyway as we as we um, go through our uh, our restoration of our fisheries. Uh, oh yeah, so Easter Taco Taipuri. This is one of Chris's uh, slides. So um, Yakati Huirapa, we have created this uh, the Easter Taco Taipuri. It was it was um, seven years. It says seven years process to get finally gazetted in, in nineteen ninety nine. So um, I'm going to take seven years off nineteen ninety nine. It was a long time ago that um, that our the elders recognised some of the issues, particularly around one one species, and that there was the power they could no longer get uh, power in in wading water, and because of tech uh, technology, uh, wetsuits and so forth, the, and and the increased popularity of this delicious uh, kaimoana our powers were disappearing. So there was something had to be done about it. But a frustratingly slow process in terms of being able to actually create a taiapuri. And then the, uh, I would say the resistance from the local community in having iwi, having Māori, having a right to the fishery that had been essentially taken from them many decades earlier. So a shared, considered a shared fishery, but um, the shared fishery led to the decline of this and, and many other species. So our taipiri uh, is centred on uh, 
a former PA site, so PA is a uh, fortified village, and, and the photo, the, this drone photo from uh, on the top there is uh, uh, Huriawa, Huriawa PA, and it, it is really the, the, um, the jewel and the crown, if you like, for the East Otago Taiapiri. It extends 22 kilometres of, um, of coastline, has four estuaries within it, and um, it essentially is the, I guess, the, the go-to place for many of uh, Chris's students. It's probably one of the most studied uh, pieces of coastline uh, in, our, in our area. Uh, and just a nod um, to two of the our elders, uh, when we finally got a uh, rahui on the taking of powers on Huriawa, uh, so a rahui is a temporary closure. And in fact, we couldn't even call it a rahui for the first few years that we had it because it would uh, create a bit of a backlash in terms of um, a, a perceived recreational rights. And so we renamed our rahui uh, temporary closure and it um, got, got a few more votes. Uh, and, and just that last one, it just reminds me of, of um, a program that we did around um, the reseeding of power um, in, in our Taiapiri a number of years ago. Chris will probably talk some more about this a little later. Yeah, thanks. A couple more. Um, th this photo, I think Chris always says to me, put up that photo. <laughs> and and uh, so this is, uh, this is kind of my take on the principles of kaitiakitanga. So we've talked about kaitiakitanga, that's the inherited stewardship, if you like, of a place, of a fishery and so forth. So uh, rahui is basically a restriction. So it's restricting activities. It might be restrict, you know, it might be a seasonal restriction, or it might be a restriction around um, technology. It might be uh, not using certain methods for fishing, you know, regardless of species. It might be uh, a set net ban or a um, you know closure. Uh, Modi is simply that's the, the life force that a uh, an area or a place does have. So Modi is something that can be enhanced or degraded by by human beings. It uh, depending on how we interact with our natural environment. Uh, utu is another principle of kaitiakitanga, and that's around reciprocity. That's around the payment, if you, if you take, then you give. So that's, it's about responsibility of being a manager, if you like, or, or a, uh, a steward of an area. That ability to be able to take, but also comes, as I say, with responsibility in terms of rebuilding or protecting something for the future generations. And then Rakinui, uh, Papatuanuku, and Takaroa. So Rakinui, the sky father, Papatuanuku, the earth, and Takaroa, the ocean. So the, the interconnectedness of these three atua uh, drive a lot of the a lot of the work that we do in our Taiapiri. So I mean, it, it could be uh, translated in, is into Ki Uta Ki Tai, mountains to sea, or it could be uh, translated into um, I said other thing, eco systems-based management, you know, that, that, you, know you, you, you know, you know what we're talking about here anyway, folks. Um, oh, that's me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got another slide there. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, He Pātaka Wairua is this um, project that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So it's a 200-year restoration plan. So we looked at um, a sort of a baseline of 200 years. You know, that's what we, we picked because we got some information of what the resources were 200 years ago. Uh, Kaumatua were interviewed in Kaitahu in the 1880s, and they described these um, mahinga kai, these um, kaimoana uh, areas. So we've set a, a realistic time frame for the restoration of our catchment. And um, here I've kind of uh, cleverly written 30 down, so 30 years down. We're into 30 years of, of habitat restoration, so we've got 170 to go. So um, we can talk about that in more detail at some other time. It's a complicated plan. <laughs> um, yeah, and waka, really important part of connecting our people uh, to the moana and to the awa because 
when um, a decade or two ago, uh, people were um, often relegated to bystanders in terms of RMA decisions and so forth. So without having that connection and feeling helpless, a lot of degradation has taken place. And we, because of that disconnect, and so part, part of the restoration work that we do is to encourage our young ones and our not so young ones to get on the water, get in the water and enact with it so that, that once again, they can learn or relearn some of these stories and continue on this uh, matauranga, the, the traditional or local knowledge of a place. So very important to have that uh, experience, that, um, that connection um, to the environment so that you will not stand by and watch the degradation uh, continue. Yeah, I'm going to hand over to Chris now because he's, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Um, and I'm going to be asking for a lot more help from Brendan than he asked of me. Well, he tried, but I didn't provide any help, did I? Uh, so we've talked a little bit about Mahaka Kai, Mahinga Kai. Um, and so Naitahu settlement um, that occurred around about 1998, 1998 one of the tall tōtara, or um, it's a big tree that grows mainly, you know, primarily in the south, um, was Mahinga Kai. And I'll share this story from Brendan, and I'm sorry, Brendan, but I'm going to do it anyhow, because he tells me these different things and they stay with me. And this one thing, so Brendan comes from a place called Matauda, or Mataura, or Mataura, depending on where you're from. The correct way to say it is Mataura. It's too, like the Mataura, the river I talked about. Brendan lived there, um, and with his father, who's a real, he is Mahinga Kai, he breathes it, he lives it. He talks on Brendan, rings him every day and talks to him for about 20 minutes about oysters. Um, when Brendan was young, the marae, the meeting houses of Naitahu were not there. The tareo, the language was not there, but the mahinga kai was there. Those traditions and those things that were passed down were still there. And that's one thing that as a Pakeha New Zealander, as a European who Alison mentioned, we came, came here in 1850 and made a mess. Um, that is, you know, that, that speaks to me because I understand that. And as a scientist, that's what excites me about working with people like Brendan, the ahika, the people on the land, the people who keep the home fires burning. So, um, and, and we work with ahika tangata tiaki, the customary fishery managers, um, the people that look after our coastal areas in Ma Tai Tai Taipuri. Sometimes they don't have them. But these are the people, and I can see some pictures of some really important figures in the South who do research. People quite often don't call it science, but it's, it's amazing the work that they do. And um, I could talk all day about you know, the people that are pictured there. So um, for me, um, Ma Tai 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 Puri customary protection areas are um, the primary way that we are managing our marine environment at the moment and including people in that. And Nick gave another talk um, earlier and talked about in the Hauraki of the leadership of iwi um, and hapu there and, and them really taking a front foot to try to deal with some of those um, issues that Nick eloquently um, explained. Um, and, and that work that Nick does is really useful for us in the South and, and actually trying to understand the right way to do things, but also quite importantly, what not to do. And through mistakes, we learn a lot. So. As a scientist, um, and I am a scientist, I go and measure things. Um, our role is quite clear. Our role is to um, support communities in their leadership, provide information to decision makers, try to understand who can, who can do this, um, and we tend to go and, and work with people. I mentioned them before, the people on the ground, they're fun to work with. That's probably primarily why we do it. Um, but, you know, they, they've got the energy and the pathways to change public, public policy and practice. If we go to a place and we do some work that's informed by matauranga, the local knowledge, by local aspirations, and we provide some science alongside that, some numbers, things tend to happen, rightly or wrongly. So that's where we sit as scientists in this space. Um, here's a great picture of Brendan that he hates, but I really like it. This is Brendan on his river 
the Waikawaiti. And behind him is a guy called Greg Kerr. I'm not sure if Greg's on at the moment, but one of the founding members of the Verlaines. You might have heard of the Megan sound. Um, probably not. Do you think they would have? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so and in his family back there, Viv, and I think that's Tomo, was it? Back further. And on the river. And Brendan's contemplating, you can't get a serious photo of Brendan, contemplating managing the river, the connections to the sea, um, and just the complexity of, of that, and also oh, just the complexity of corporate versus customary, and all these, everyone wanting a bit of something, and, and um, just how you do it. And to, so to manage that issue, power, you know, it's, if, we, if we want to manage power, and that's um, abalone, if you didn't know, um, Brendan needs to think about all these, all of these things. And this is um, a bit of work that Brendan, came out of Brendan's brain, and Daniel Pritchard put it into, into this sort of, sort of mind map or something like that. And you can just see how complex it is for someone um, to actually manage. And we sometimes we get a little bit disheartened, probably confused by the, it's just an enormous thing to actually, engage and manage natural environments and ecosystems in a way that you have to do it. You just can't, there aren't any shortcuts. You have to understand the people, I think that's out at that end, Takata, um, education, stakeholders, mapping the landscape, Tonga species, that's a treasured species, cultural keystones. Um, it's, it's very complex. So people quite often say, hey, let's do some community led management. Well, there it is there, and it's just as expensive as getting um, top-down management, but if you're going to restore um, a marine ecosystem, this is what you've got to do. I think, Brendan. Um, so for our little mesocosm, the East Otago Taipuri that Brendan mentioned, and his work that he's been leading out, um, connected um, as a New Zealand's largest op um, open cast gold miners at the headwaters, of the Waikawaiti River. Um, we have a large um, dredge spoil disposal area. Um, we have two, uh, three sewage outfall systems. Some of them are low and exposed to sea level rise. Uh, we have excessive water take. We have inappropriate um, plantings of exotic species. We have it all. We have, we have fisheries, commercial fisheries hmm. um, that are overexploited. It's just a, microcosm for everywhere. Um, I've been in to court with Brendan um, to fight the dredge disposal in that dredge site. So this is some of the things we're doing and the real positive stuff sits around um, that stuff. Actually doing something positive in the restoration space. There's threats to the marine reserve and one of them is marine reserves. Um, sorry, Nick, but you can see I'm on the marine reserve forum right there. Um, so we need to understand the different, the different perspectives of marine reserves. For Brendan, a marine reserve is something that challenges the settlement for Naitahu. So it needs to be very carefully considered when you close an area. And there's some amazing work going on around the Southeast Marine Protection Forum, hopefully at this moment, where we're gonna establish some marine reserves, but they're gonna have some really cool sort of ways of doing things, new ways of doing things that allow marine reserves to start moving again in our country because really they're quite stalled. Um, so, you know, there is that opportunity in the work that's being done there and that really nice connection and working closely with Tangata Whenua, Mana Whenua. Brendan, you, you wouldn't want to talk about that, would you? No. Yeah. Um, other things, invasive species. Um, I know Nick's got um, Andaria pinnatifida in, um, in the North Island Wakami, which has come from um, Korea and Japan um, is a major um, issue in our um, Taipuri. And we've also got a new species, uh, Bonamasonia, that's just arrived. And there's other invasives that are causing issues as well. Um, I don't mean to go on about Nick, but he's done some work on, on this sort of stuff, warming. Um, the, the warming is occurring at a greater rate um, in the south, and it's a real hot pot, uh, hot spot and a hot pot. Um, and we were starting to be exposed to these heat waves this is the to me this is the the real scary thing for us what do we do about that and and we're working really hard um, to think about what we can do locally while at a higher level other people get their stuff together 
So back to power. Um, I think we can go back to power. That's what they look like. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, Guy Nana Lingham. Um, here's a picture of her. She um, was going to speak, but unfortunately she's unwell. This is her as a master's student diving in one of our kelp forests. I'm a kelp forest ecologist, a little bit like Nat, probably more in the physiological sort of space. And um, this is Guy helping out on our large offshore kelp forest that we have in, um, in the Taipuri. And it's similar to the, similar to the ones you might see in, in California. Um, amazing places that can be fished. You can cut them down and sell them um, under the quota management system. How crazy is that? But that's just my view. Um, so Gaia, if you did want to get in touch with someone to talk about the actual power work, here's her email address, get in touch with her. I don't have a picture of her, not in a wetsuit. Um, and she works super hard um, to work on this, um, this, this restoration of power fisheries in, um, in the, in the Taipuri and more generally. Um, she's also really quite a bit of an expert on coda and, and lobster as well. So it's a shame Guy couldn't be here to speak mm -hmm. and um, I'll just acknowledge her. Um, this is from one of Guy's slides and really the thing about um, um, power, they're a Tonga treasured species, but they're also a cultural keystone, right? They are fundamental in ways of life for Māori in the South and elsewhere as well. They are identified as the number one species of concern in surveys for both Māori and Pākehā and non-Māori uh, non in, in the South. The decline, as Brendan said, is one of the key motivations for the creation of the Taipuri, and there's a huge sense of loss for customary fishers. Um, Brendan mentioned, I'm not sure he mentioned too much. So customary fishing isn't just about taking the fish, eating the fish. It's about all of the practices, the, um, the different things, manakitanga, like the hospitality, you share this, the, the, um, the key species from your area. You know, you go to an, an older person who can't, um, who can't get their own kaimoana and you give it to them and it gives you pride, right? And I don't know if anyone who's gone and done wild food gathering might understand that, but you think of that in traditions over 750 years of that very place and that passed down through you. So it's very important. Um, so huge sense of loss, um, not only due to the stocks, but also to control, particularly the power, which was of no interest to non Māori before, I would say, the 1970s. Um, and my father would speak of going to Kaikoura and fishing and seeing power all over the place in the intertidal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, no longer. So um, here's a um, catalogue. I'm on the Thai Pretty Committee with Brendan. I've been on there probably 10 or 12 years. Um, Brendan started a few years before me. Um, and this is a catalogue of our failure. Um, we failed to manage the fishery and keep it open so we could maintain those traditions of local people. Kaumato were concerned in 1990. That's when the, um, the process came in. Um, in 2009, I turned up with the, I had some work, some funding, and we went and measured some power. And what do you know, the local people were right. They were very small and there weren't many around. So we had the closure, had it extended, in 2016, we added another closure. In 2019, we closed the whole area because we had the data that showed the decline. Tangtiaki knew, but their matauranga, their knowledge, their observations weren't taken into account. So it's a double-edged sword, right? It's great for us as scientists. And it is good, right? Because you do get that information if there is some conflict. But at the same time, um, these sort of things, because they're so important, particularly this species. If you can't do it with power, you know, um, abalone are the poster child of serial depletion all around the world. So, yeah, so we see it as a failure that the, um, the power fishery is closed. And it's disappointing to us because we know that the practices associated with power fishing could disappear relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a range of regulations, some I'm probably a little bit more proud of. We reduced the bag limit. Um, well before um, the rest of the um, reductions that occurred around blue cod, we've protected um, all habitat forming kelps. Um, 
you know, we, we have closed power, um, but that's a real disappointment for us. And we tried, we tried reseeding, we tried small closures, we reduced bag limits. We tried everything. We even considered a waiting only fishery. Brendan considered only naked people allowed to be going and getting power. In the South, you're not going to be getting many. That's a traditional way of doing it. We tried, but apparently you can't do that. Can you, Brendan? No, health and safety. Uh, never mind. Um, um, yeah, so I'll just sort of quick, quick plug here. Um, so the, the next steps on this thing are going to be supported by the Coastal People Southern Sky Centre of Research Excellence. So this program is, has a real vision of um, restoring the Modi, the Modi order, the flourishing wellness, Brendan mentioned it before. Um, and really we're looking to restore in a future facing manner, looking to what will be and restoring to that. Our values are based on mana and kaitiaki tanga. Can you explain mana to me, Brendan? Mana, mm. uh, prestige, yeah. Honor, yeah, yeah. So no one will ever tell you they have mana. If they have mana, would that be correct? Brendan has mana, but he won't admit it. Um, I certainly do not. Um, hey, um, yeah, but in this case, um, it's, we have this, you know, our, our values in action. Kaitiaki Tanga, Brendan talked about that. And that's some real important, those principles speak so strongly to someone like Nick and I who have an ecological training. Um, you know, they, there, aren't, there is no conflict between those things in science, I don't think. I don't see the conflict between, if you take something, you need to put it back. If things are connected, everything has value in the ecosystem. And this is, um, you know, our stuff's about action. So we're really looking, and Nick's involved in the um, Coastal People Southern Skies, or he will be, he's listed there somewhere, and we're looking forward to, to getting some of the work happening in the North too. Um, oh, and a key thing about Coastal People Southern Skies is, I mm. know oh, no presentation would be complete without a, a great shot of a, a waka. Uh, this is waka Honui that belongs to Tatuki Voyaging Trust. And so Tatuki and Honui waka are part of um, the coastal people, Southern Skies, along with a, a whole lot of other kaupapa that uh, Honui is involved in. So Honui and six other canoes uh, formed a fleet uh, called uh, Te Mano Te Moana. So there's that word mana, uh, the spirit of the ocean, that's what it was called. And that was, uh, I was just contemplating on it today, it was about 10 years ago that uh, these canoes sailed across the Pacific. Uh, the kaupapa, the, you know, the reason for sailing um, was twofold. One was to, I guess, silence some of the naysayers that 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 didn't believe that Maori um, actually found this island uh, on purpose, and so it was it was to silence some of those critics. It was also to um, revitalise uh, the the almost lost um, matauranga or the knowledge around traditional navigation and wayfinding. So finding little islands in the middle of, uh, of seemingly nowhere. Uh, that, uh, that globe that Nick put on one of his first slides just shows just the distance between, or well, how isolated this place is. Uh, the, th well, I said there was, there, was, there was two reasons for the voyage. There was, I've mentioned two, but there was a third one as well. And that was, that was to um, bring, I guess, to the Western, world the uh, understanding that some of their actions it has uh, to the Pacific Islands, you know, in terms of, uh, well, we call it, I don't think it was called climate change when these canoes sailed, uh, sailed across the Pacific, sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge and, and then back or right across the Pacific. But the idea was to um, uh, bring to the forefront the, the plight of the Pacific islands and you know around climate change and um, the the funder of this voyage he thought what better way than bringing some pacific peoples on these canoes that don't use fossil fuels and uh, bring their message uh, to the you know to the what well, to us all these canoes are still sailing and a beautiful way to uh, connect that, that old knowledge, that mātauranga with, you know, modern technology, modern materials, and, you know, obviously modern, modern issues.
Yeah, so um, we'll try and move along a bit as we're going on. Um, yeah, so really the, um, we're looking to continue the restoration of this cultural icon. That includes continued monitoring, which is really important. Work on stock enhancement research that is focused on and guided by kangatiaki and local views using local stock. And an experimental fishery, a little bit like what Nick said with the marine reserves, but we have the capability to actually do reef by reef management, understand if you take this many, what does it mean? And so there's a real opportunity through that closure to actually allow us to learn and reopen because we can't keep it closed. I don't know, in Kaikoura, there was a reopening recently based on simply bag limits and it got absolutely nailed. And any gains that you get when you reopen a fishery without bag limits as a control, you're going to be in a world of hurt. We know that from Toedo, the surf plan fishery in the south of here, where there used to be days when people would go and just hammer the fishery. We have, we've had sacrifice, or we, um, the local people have sacrificed for 10 years. We can't have that disappear in a day. And it will. It will. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge um, just one thing, and, and we're nearly finished, is um, a PhD thesis by um, Dr. Amory Jackson, um, Kitaki Tai. Toka So it's like the, the, the treasure passed down and the management that's been passed down. And, and Anne-Marie, um, who's a leading researcher in, in the world of um, Indigenous um, studies um, in a diverse range of places, um, a real leader and inspirational um, academic for me and many of us here, um, wrote about the Taipuri uh, process being a failure Rangateratanga, which means sovereignty, local, local control of a place. The Taipuri doesn't do that because Brendan and the Tangatiaki have to get the minister to sign off any laws. So we've gone through, a, I guess, a 10, 15 or 30 year process. The Taipuri has closed the power fishery. The power fishery can only be reopened with the say of the Tangatiaki. Rangateratanga, in some ways, has been passed on for that species. But we don't have another thousand years to do all the other species. So we need to start thinking about how do we get that trust going? How do we get people that demonstrate this commitment? And, and people start listening to them. Listen to them and let's start progressing along. Don't need science for everything. Science is super useful, um, but we, we need to start moving it's too we can't wait that's all i'd say um and just acknowledge that phd thesis from 2011 mm. it was great we worked with Anne maria back then and um we still do now she's the co-director of coastal people southern skies and a real you know inspiration for all of us so um yeah well, this is what we need to do we need to support um science local action support local leaders and this is how we will deal some of these issues we're facing and also these global stresses that um, keep Nick and I awake at night around warming particularly. Um, and we are teaching the next generation. So we're sharing this knowledge. Brendan says that, that you share matauranga. It's the most important thing. So we share what we do. We teach. We teach at the marae. We teach alongside the community. We share the things we've talked about. I've got to consider and think, well, you know, some Pakia guy from Cromwell, some of the words I know now and the things I know, it's been so such a privilege for me and so rewarding and not a sacrifice to be working alongside Naitau and, and other other Māori um, groups. So, yeah, conclusions, I'm not really that big into them, but um, mainly, I guess at the end, and, and as Brendan says, our places reflect us until we're fixed, our environment will not... Um, look any good so people come first we hope fisheries habitats and i can't see the other bits come next so thanks Kilda, thank you so much that was absolutely fascinating uh don't forget people listening in from home uh we these people are willing to answer your questions so do pop into the Q&A function at the bottom. If you have a burning question, please ask it. Um, we've seen how complicated it is. And I, 
it's complicated to do any kind of marine protection and it's complicated to get a marine reserve gazetted. It's co complicated to get Taipuri gazetted. And I, I think I know what the answer is, but a question to all of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Brendan, and then we'll, and Chris, and then we'll throw it in Nick, is does it, should it be this complicated to create reserves, to create Taipuri? Should it? No, I think you do know the answer. I <laughs> should. It really shouldn't be, but I, I think that, uh, you know, perceived rights rather than perceived privileges, you know, kind of guide a lot of their uh, thinking. And um, it's it's very difficult to give up something that, you know, you feel is, is yours. So um, I, I, I think in terms of customary protection rather than marine protection, I, I just think that, you know, with the discussions that we've had is, you know, having, you need to have humans in there somehow, but somehow restricting their, their activities. Um, that didn't make sense that last bit, but uh, I'm trying to, trying to uh, advocate for the need for people to be involved in management, uh, like active management and restoration of areas, rather than just being locked up for, you know, uh, for perpetuity. I'll just follow up Brendan's thing about rights. Some people are happy to have rights to nothing. They'll rather have the rights to fish than the actual fish. And that is, to me, one of the big problems we face because, in the end, the fish are central. And connected to that are the people and, and, and what their practices are very important. But quite often, that, that privilege that Brendan speaks of just clouds us a little bit and also the lack of trust and it is really difficult it's a contested space but even if you close one area out of someone's eight fishing spots i still hyper angry about it for some reason so yeah i don't know people that's a problem right <laughs> sorry you just said people were the thing you wanted to include they also had the problem and that too, you know sorry <laughs> And there's too many people. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting to see the contrast between what you guys are doing and then it's a battle where you guys are. And then the Hauraki Golf is next level. I mean, no disrespect, but in terms of numbers of people. And then also another complication is the, the, the multiple... Mount Fenua, um, which all have to, everyone has to work together. There's so many people, there's so many competing uses. Um, and that's, you know, in part why it's all ground to a halt. Mm. It's a bit negative. <laughs> Brendan, you talked about there being a lot of resistance in the beginning to the idea of putting a rahui on the fishery to the, ex to the point where you couldn't call it a rahui. Have the people who were protesting or resisting come around, do you think? Yes, yeah, I think they have. We've, um, yeah, we can call it Arahui now, <laughs> and, um, and we can speak uh, of these things in the local fishing clubs. Um, I think one of the things that kind of galvanised a bit of support for our Taipiri was um, the uh, the power reseeding that we did maybe about six or seven years ago, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, like numbers of powers surviving, uh, Chris reckons that it was a failure, but in, in my thinking, it was the first time that we'd actually done something um, proactive rather than reactive in our, in our fishery. So we, we had well over a hundred people, local people come down to put these, powers uh, that we were reseeding about four or five hundred thousand of these little guys in the water and so it was then I think there was a kind of a shift in, in, in people's psyche they, they understood that it was actually their fishery that it was a local fishery belonging to the locals and they had actually at that stage done something in a positive way rather than a restricting uh, nature if you know what I mean so this was actually putting powers back, those powers are ours, they're our responsibility now. And I think there, there was a shift then that they, a 
little bit of that mistrust that might have been in the previous decades uh, kind of disappeared and people now have taken ownership uh, at least of you know that that fishery uh, and you know want to want to see it come come right they actually realize that perhaps uh, <laughs> uh, the these guys were might have been you know might have something there you know so uh, yeah that's that that's that's a, a change that I've seen in the last few years and the, the big change in the Hauraki Gulf I, I said everything ground to a halt and that as a result of that we have seen big changes in the recent years declines and scallops and things like that but it's iwi that have taken the lead and they have got tools that can do things fast so with the rahui's been implemented you know that's real been really positive um and has also got the conversation going and highlighted the need for for action so i'm not sure if i expressed that that clearly when in my talk but i intended to <laughs> Well, we've got you, Nick. Someone anonymous has asked, and it's to do with your comments about snapper and crayfish within the reserve seeding so much outside and contributing to fish populations outside the marine reserve. If the reserves are contributing a disproportionate amount of larvae to surrounding areas, are there concerns about a reduction in genetic diversity in the population over time? Yeah. I um, I'd say that's highly, well, very unlikely. Um, well, one, one being the reserves are so small at the moment, and so it's, it's relative to their small size that they produce a lot of um, larvae. Um, they're still only producing, the lead one was producing about 10 or 11%, but genetic diversity, lack of genetic diversity becomes a problem of very small populations. And so that's what's actually, there's evidence of that happening as a result of fisheries. So where fish populations, including snapper at the top of the South Island, there's a study that showed that the fishery, fishing there, um, I think in the, early, in the 50s, depleted the population so much that it had lower genetic diversity. So yeah, fishing can actually cause that, um, but a reserve is actually going to increase the population size. So I would say reduce any chance of um, reduced genetic diversity. So no, I don't think it's a problem. Maybe another reason why um, protecting areas and protecting stocks is a good idea. And I, I, I noticed, I, I flip-flop, you know, between using reserve, the term reserve and MPA. And for years we've talked about marine reserves, but as Chris has alluded to, I think we are moving well beyond that whether it's customary protected areas or um, at least protected, some form of protected areas that more clearly acknowledges the customary um, rights and or practices. Um, and that's, that's where the proposals in the Hodaki Gulf are trying to accommodate that um, in, a, in a fairly complex uh, landscape, seascape. Okay, a couple of questions here that I'll read them out together. This is probably more for Brendan and or Chris. Is there legal support from government for iwi to, that iwi can get if or when a rahui is broken by someone? For example, someone would be caught collecting power when they shouldn't. And then the second part of that question was, is legal prosecution then a way that iwi would actually want to use to handle such a thing? Or are other values and strategies used? So. Yeah, how do you police your rahui, Brendan? Yeah, the um, government does does provide the legislation and the um, compliance, so fines or or whatever. But um, the way that we, I guess, what was the uh, strategies used? We're, we're, I guess, we're trying to play the long game in terms of educating people not not trying to get angry like we might have done a few years ago and um, uh, done things that we can't actually talk about here uh, for fear of uh, retribution but um, we these days we 
we just try to uh, get people to understand, um, you know, the, the issues around it. We will we will take catches off people if we see them, um, but the educating their the children, those next generations, I think, is one of the strategies. One of the the, the the strategy that'll probably work the best for us, that understanding and, and some of those slides that, uh, in the presentation that we talked about around um, making people value it and connecting them to that. One thing I'd just add to that is prosecutions do occur. Um, we've had prosecutions of repeat offenders in the Taipuri, so they have gone to court. But in the end, when it's a family who've been down in the van, and taking it, and the option is either a $750 fine or throw them into jail, it gets very difficult. So that education is very important, and also the bravery of people like Brendan, I can see Susie Flack, she could be related, um, going down to people on the shore and just talking to them and saying, well, you can't do this. So at Ahui can be legally enforced, and they can also be enforced by this. And that, I've seen them on the East Coast, um, and that's not good for anybody, particularly the people that are trying to protect their fishery, because in the end, you know, it's good to have that enforcement support and legal support, but it's hard to get. So sometimes you've just got a, so many different rahui around there, they can be quite different. So, yeah. Now, speaking of Susie Flake, there is a question from her for Nick. Kia ora, Nick. I'm loath to target a species, but do your researchers ever take any kinna to kinna lovers of local iwi? Not to clean them out, but to help out with the kelp. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, that's a whole, um, yeah, whole nother story and topic really. Um, we are doing research on the role of removing kinna as a means of restoring kelp. Um, and obviously when you take the kinna away, the kelp grows back, but that's only a, a temporary solution on its own. I mean, ideally we need to allow the the ecosystem to recover, allow those predators to come back and keep the kinna under control. Um, one of the problems with kinna from a barren, um, from kinna barrens, is they have very little food to eat themselves. So they're at high densities, there's not much food. So their row condition, the row that people like to eat, is generally poor. It's uh, skinny and often brown and not so good to eat. So harvest, there's, there's there's potential for, for harvesting um, and increasing the harvest, but it's, it's yeah, it's, it could be, it's one tool in the sort of solution. So when, when we have done kinna removal work, we um, were able to provide the kinna to the local iwi um, and we'd send them texts, say, oh, we've got another few bins of kinna, um, do you want them? And then after we delivered them a few times, they stopped replying to the text, which, uh, indicated they went too flash to, um, to <laughs> eat. <laughs> They're also nice, smaller. Nice try. <laughs> now I've got a, um, we've got five minutes left and in that time I'd like to jump forward a few decades. So Brendan, you talked about the fact that it's been a 30 year journey to where you are now. You've got a 200 year vision, so you've got 170 years to go. Obviously, none of us are going to be around in 170 years. But can I ask each of you, in 170 years, what would your vision be of your local marine environment? What are you hoping to see? Kelp. I want to see that we still have kelp forests, because I don't think we will. So that's one thing that we're really working on, because kelp forests are the coral reefs of our place. So. Um, how do we how do we maintain those things? I know people are important and all that sort of stuff, but I'm a kelp forest person. I love giant kelp. It provides everything to our coast. It's, it connects. It, it provides for Brendan and his community in so many different ways. And without that, I, that just um, I'm probably, I'm a very positive person. We are working on restoring kelp forests and developing a super kelp that might be able to withstand these heat waves. But if we still have kelp, and if we have kelp, it means that Brendan's fixed the catchment. The sediment that flows from the land will be captured 
and the plantings that Brendan has done. How many trees have you planted, Brendan? Hundreds of thousands of them. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but be. many, many of them. And that means, I know I'm focused on one thing, but that's, I hope that's kelp. Yeah. I'll, I'll um, go to the kelp of the land. That's the uh, native plantings that we've been doing on our river, on our catchment. So um, yeah, those, those 30 year old trees now and in 170 years will be pretty big. And that's, that's the thing I'm, I would be looking forward to. And um, we were, we're talking about that um, restoration. And I, I, I hope that in you know, the last 50 years of that 200 year plan that, that humans won't need to be involved quite so heavily as, as they are now in terms of restoration and riparian planting of uh, those catchments that the, the modi of that of those forests will sustain the ongoing um, continuation of those forests. Now, I, I think I'd like to see um, much more balance in how we treat the marine environment. Um, we have been through decades of and de you know of very very high levels of extra extraction. So in the, in the Hauraki Gulf, we have definitely areas where sediment runoff, and we want to be improving the land. But these islands that I showed you, Poturu and the Mokohinaus. You know, we don't know what those areas would be like if they, you know, we don't really know what they were like before that before fishing happened. So I, I think we just, yeah, we need to step back and look to see what happens in some of these places if we leave them alone. We've learned quite a lot just from, you know, tiny little places like Lee. And um, yeah, I think we've got a lot to learn by leaving places alone as well. It's going to be a roller coaster ride, people. I am going to call it to a close. A huge thank you to our speakers for tonight, Brendan, Chris, and Nick. I learn so much from you every time I hear you speak. To our audience out there, thanks for being here and for asking questions. This has been a UNESCO Ocean Decade event brought to you from Aotearoa, New Zealand by Kopapa Moana, Sea Week. Namihi nui, Atamarie, good night. <laughs>